All right, so now we move on to a whole new different set of networks called regional area networks. So what was WiMAX? What area was WiMAX? Metropolitan. Metropolitan area networks. That was WAN. Now this is RAN. Um, and this is what we call 802.22. So that was 16, and this is 22, IEEE standard. So we'll talk about different key features and, um, and super frames and channel management and so on and so forth about this. And the key difference, actually, let me just first tell you what, okay, so here's the thing. Basically, this standard is designed to use the frequencies that are not used by the television stations. So the television stations have certain frequencies allocated to them, which is from 54 megahertz to 862 megahertz band. Each station gets about 6 megahertz. And what they do is, if you basically they divide the country into areas, and in each area they they give to certain number of television stations 6 megahertz. So there might be some channels which may not be totally at all allocated in that area, right? And even if it is allocated, some of the stations may not be using it all the time. They may just come up for a, an hour or two in a day. And now, since the bandwidth is so desirable and we need as every bit of it, so they said, okay, if you want to use it, you can go ahead and use it, but as soon as the station comes up, you have to get off. So that's the key difference between this and the WiMAX. In WiMAX, we had a guaranteed reserved bandwidth, reserved actually spectrum. Here, the spectrum is not reserved. The spectrum is basically whatever is available. The primary owner has the first right. So when the television comes on, within a few milliseconds, it should be off. And so what you have to do is you have to continuously sense a number of channels and see which are available and tell your receivers same thing. Receivers also have to jump off to the new channel. So when the base station says, well, now we are all moving to a station in that other room, everybody goes to that other room. Right? And then suddenly a class starts in that room. You say, well, now we don't have a space here. Let's move to this other room we know is available right now. So you keep moving from channel to channel, the whole group. And so that's what is new about this, right? Now, why is it called regional area network? Because these are lower frequencies. What is the difference between high frequency and lower frequency? Anybody remembers the difference? What is good about lower frequency? Huh? You can go what? Buildings. Through building? Well, I mean, you can go around the building, so they are non-line of sight, that is one, okay. But there are other things in terms of distance. Yeah, see, la lower frequencies can go longer distance. And the higher frequencies, um, you know, don't go that far. So these are 54 to 862 megahertz. These are much lower than what frequencies we were talking about for WiMAX. Anybody remembers any spectrum number for WiMAX? Or if you don't remember for WiMAX, do you remember for Wi Fi? Yeah, 2.4 gigahertz, which is 2400 megahertz. So this one is only 800 megahertz. And so these are all very good frequencies because they go very far. You can cover, actually television covers 45 kilometers, 45 miles. So it goes very far, that, that's how far you can go. Obviously it depends upon the power you send. So television stations have a lot of power. The radio station, the, the wireless station will not send that much power. So they probably go less. But the frequencies are good so they can go. So basically, so the idea is they can cover all the way up to 100 kilometers in good conditions. Obviously, it depends upon the condition as well, the weather. But um, depending upon the height of the tower, 
you can go basically you will be able to get many bits per hertz up to some point less bits per hertz as you go farther and even less bits per hertz as you go very far right so so that's the thing so 802.20 the regional area network standard is designed for sharing the spectrum from the television stations which are off that's clear right all right so 1.5 megabits down and the goal was to have 1.5 megabits down and 384 kilobits up um and your coverage should be at least 50% of the location in the fringe areas 99% of the time 99.9% of the time so in the fringe area what happens is this is the fringe area and the coverage is not a circle like this coverage could be that it is good up to here but then it goes up down then up and then down like that so it's a very irregular kind of thing depending upon where the mountains where the hills where the trees are right and so in that region we should have at least 50% of the area covered uh, so if you want to call it covered so there is an area which is beyond this which is only 40% covered beyond that only 30% covered and so on and so forth so generally when we define coverage here we are talking at least 50% or more of that circle is covered and you should be you can get if you get 2 bits per hertz you can get 12 megabits in 6 megahertz channel what is 6 megahertz 6 megahertz is the width of the tv channel old tv channels old means the analog tv channel we no longer have analog tv channels in the united states does anybody remember when did we change to digital television yeah last year in february okay and in fact because we were not able to switch on february i think it was moved to june or july but basically so this year right now we have all digital television so that also opened up some spectrum because digital channels take only 1/6 of the 6 megahertz which is 1 megahertz so they just take 1/6 for the same quality actually better quality tv quality is better and the bits are less and sorry bits are that uh, well hertz are less so as a result lot of tv spectrum opened up right when we switched from digital to anal analog to digital but this is not about that this is about this can be used in any country where they have analog or digital it doesn't matter even digital channels today sometimes they are on sometimes they are not on so we can use that spectrum with 2 bits per hertz you can get 12 megabits out of 6 megahertz and if you use um, 40 to 1 over subscription what is 40 to 1 over subscription is that you have only 12 megabits but you can sell as if you have 12 times 40 480 megabits you will sell it to 255 users 480 divided by 255 you will say well each user have 1.5 megabits that's how they sell obviously they don't have if everybody uses 1.5 megabit they will run out in 5 users 6 users i mean are eight users so but that is 40 to 1 over subscription and that worked actually in the old days it, it doesn't work anymore that kind of over subscription in the old days it worked because our network utilization is generally 1 to 2% so when we say 255 users only 1 to 2% of them are active 2% of 255 is 5 users right right but today it is different now because of the dsl and not dsl because of p2p we might use 100% people might be on for hours continuously using full bandwidth right anybody who does bit torrent or something like that they know this that you know they use full bandwidth for whole day and that is killing the phone companies because they are not designed for that kind of business they have they, they cannot oversubscribe that much anymore 
All right, so let's see. I mean, this is, should be clear right now where, where the ran stands for. Ran stands beyond the man. If you have few tens of kilometer, that is man. If you have few hundreds of kilometer, that is ran. Actually, we have put here um, both the distance. Then we have put the data rate. The data rate generally goes down, right? I mean, except for the pan, but you know, pan could be 100 megabits too. But basically, the, as you go distance, higher in distance, the rate goes down. Here we have put the spectrum. Now, as you go farther, you need lower and lower spectrum, and lower and lower, I mean, basically the frequencies. And here is the standard for that. So how is 22 different from 16? First of all, it uses all the things which are in 16, most the best of it, which is centralized allocation. Why did we have centralized allocation compared to Wi-Fi? I just told you a minute ago that it is centralized so that none of the bits get, get wasted. Everything is utilized full, right? It has the same service classes, UGS, RDPS, and RDPS, and BE. What is missing here? ERDPS. And that was added to WiMAX much later. So this probably will get added here by the time this becomes in practice, comes in practice. Then they have a similar quality of service parameters such as peak and sustained rate. Now peak is the maximum, sustained is the average. Max latency and jitter. So you can specify the, you know, for some classes such as real-time classes, what is the maximum latency and what is the jitter. All right. It has OFDMA. Right. It has slots. It has down subframe and up subframe. It has burst. Now instead of DL, UL, they call it DS, US, downstream and upstream. And SS is called CPE. SS was what? Subscriber station. Now it is called CPE. CPE is a customer premises equipment. Customer premises equipment, CPE is actually is an old term from the phone company for the thing which are at the customer's premises, like your phone is a CPE. So here it is called CPE because this is not really designed for mobile objects, it is designed for home service, rural area service. So this is something that they put at your home. Then they have connections just like WiMAX, 12-bit connection ID, does anybody remember how many bits was the connection ID for um, WiMAX? Just few slides before we had a connection ID field in the acknowledgement. Remember ARQ? 16 bit. Here it is 12 bit. And then they have connections, basic connection, primary connection, secondary. These are all very similar to WiMAX. Ranging and request is similar to WiMAX. Anybody remembers what is ranging? So there are two problems actually here I can see. First of all, I did not give you homework on WiMAX. So nobody has read anything whatsoever because you didn't get time to review anything. Uh, so you really, I need to give a homework and I have to design a homework. Maybe I will bring you homework. But the thing is next week is vacation week, right? So it doesn't help too much. Uh, however, um, anyway, let me just go back. Anybody, anybody remember ranging? What is ranging? Yeah. Yeah, so there is a way to find out how far you are so that we can control the power level and so on and so forth and determine the coding for you. So all that is done as usual in WiMAX. Contention, there is a contention reason for bandwidth request and ranging and that was in the uplink frame. That is all very similar. And then they have the max subheaders like bandwidth request, fragmentation subheaders, grant management, packing, and 
So, all these things I described in detail in Biomax ex explicitly for this reason is that those fields are all going for any standard coming up after that is borrowing the same thing, is following the same thing. We don't have to reinvent the same things. So, this is one of the standards which is after 16 and so it follows everything that 16 did plus some more. Okay. So now, we have to classify each channel. First, we have to sense if either a TV or another network is active in that channel. Right? And um, then it could be in band. So if you are in channel N, then the in band is N plus 1 and N minus 1, out of band any other channel. So if you are on channel 6, channel 5 and 7 are in band and every other channel is out of band. Geolocation is the, your geographical location. Your geographical location is basically your latitude and longitude. Right? So. <coughs> So that has to be known. And then waypoint is any WRAN device whose location is known. So there are base stations which know exactly where they are located. If they know it, then you can measure your distance from three points and figure out where you are located. Right? So what you do is you measure your distance from waypoints to find your location. Once you find your location, you become a waypoint as well. Framing. So they have frames just like Ymax had a frame. Remember in Ymax we had a frame, 5 millisecond long frame, which was divided into downlink and uplink. Exactly like that we have frames, but there are certain things that we don't want to do in every frame, so we do it once in a number of frames, every 16th frame, so therefore 16 frames are called a super frame. And before every 16 frames, we have some a special header, which is called the super frame header. Right? And so every frame has a header, but then every 16th frame has an extra header, which is a super frame header. Alright? So, so you can see frame 0 through 15, 16 frames, with each with a preamble. And and but every six and then there is an extra. This one is a little bit bigger than the other frames. Okay. Now it says that the first frame's payload is reduced by two symbols to compensate for super frame preamble and super frame control header. So there is a super frame preamble and super frame control header. So this payload part is two bytes shorter than this in other frames. They could actually have kept probably, you know, but I don't know why they decided to take it off from the payload, but they did decide to, there must be some reason, but anyway, so they, the payload is two bytes less in the first frame. SCS, now here, here is the two-dimensional map. Remember the two-dimensional map for the Bimax? This is the down and this is the up. In the down part, we, we had before also a preamble, then we had the frame control header, then we have the DS and the, the downlink map and the uplink map, exactly the same way it is here. And then we had a number of burst, burst 1, burst 2, burst 3, it's just shown differently. But basically, two things are different here. One is that instead of having a rectangle like they had in Ymax, they, here they have just columns. So you go down the column, go to the next column, go to the next column, go to the next column, and so on and so forth. So if this burst finished here, the next burst starts from there and goes to the next column. Okay? And here you go by the rows. And this was the same thing as Ymax. In Ymax, 
and you went down like this. You, each station, when they start, they go up to the whole end of the row, and, and they also next row beginning to the end up to some point, and then other station can start. Okay. Um, the reason why it is um, vertical here and horizontal here is that here what happens is every station listens to the common part, all the maps and UCDs, and then it goes off and listens only in the columns that it is supposed to receive something. Saves the battery. So we are trying to minimize the reception time. Right? In the transmission, while transmitting, if I have to transmit, then we want to minimize the power level. Right? So we want to keep as few carriers as possible and we maximize the time. Right? So we want to go as far as possible. So that's why these are horizontal. But the height is minimal. The width is maximum. Height is the smallest that can be for that many bytes. Right? So we are minimizing the number of carriers. We are minimizing the power. Here, we are minimizing the power also here, but by minimizing the time, we are up. When we are up, we listen to all the channels, all the frequencies. All right. So SCH, now come back to SCH. SCH indicates whether the frame or, um, frame or coexistence beacon follows it. So here is the, this should be SCH, not FCH. This is the SCH. And so that indicates whether, you know, there is a real frame or not. And then the boundaries are up to just like, you know, before we have, you could have as much in downlink and uplink depending upon the traffic. I mean, actually you don't do it depending on the traffic. You decide right, right on day one that the ratio is two to one or three to one or one to one. And then DS versus are vertical, US versus are horizontal. Urgent coexistence situation notification. So there's a UCS right there. So there is a contention period in the beginning of the uplink burst. There is a period in which you can contend. And that contention period is used for three things. It is used for ranging. It is used for bandwidth request. And it is used for UCS, which is the urgent coexistence situation. What that means is that if you are a subscriber and suddenly you start hearing a TV signal, you tell the base station, which is 100 miles away, may not have heard that TV station, that sorry, I am hearing a TV station in this channel, let's move. All right? So that UCS signal is urgent coexistent situation notification, is that the primary owner is back, we have to empty the room. And we tell it to the base station. Base station can already automatically move too without any, anybody telling it because if it hurts the channel, but since the distances are so large, it's quite possible that the base station has not heard that TV. Okay, so UCS is clear? Yeah. So, uh, no, no. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, so what happens is now as soon as anybody hears, the steps will be taken to move and they will have to move within a certain time and that is the time which is prescribed by FCC that within so many milliseconds you should be off the channel, maybe, maybe two seconds or something like that, you should be off. Is that what you are saying? So, yes, I mean... Well, I mean, I was just going to say that the base station might not ever hear it. Base station may never hear it. Yeah, because it's out of range. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So the thing is, base station doesn't have to hear it. As long as somebody heard it, 
they are in the network and they tell the base station, base station has to trust it. Right? And so it will just move. All right. So each, each channel is classified as um, either available or disallowed or operating or backup or candidate or occupied or unclassified. Right? Available is clear, not occupied by any TV transmitter. Disallowed, even though it is available, we have been told that channel 5 is for police only and you cannot use it. So that is disallowed. Operating means we are using in this one. Backup, this is our next list. So basically, when a station comes on, they get the whole list. They said, okay, look. This is our list of available channels, this is our list of backup channels, this is our list of unallowed channels and so on and so forth. So this is our backup channel. Candidate for backup and then occupied by other networks, unclassified, we don't know about them. Unavailable, occupied by TV transmitters. All right? So this whole channel map is kept and distributed to everyone. And then the channel management has to be done. So there is a channel termination request and response message, a message that is goes from the base station to subscriber stations which says that, look, we are going to close channel 5. And um, it is announced by the base station if the incumbent comes back. Incumbent means the primary owner comes back then we send this, channel, this request. Then channel add request and response to add TV channels to the base station list. So there is a whole table that we have kept. When you join, we'll give you the whole table, but then we, later on we might add or subtract something, right? Channel switch request and response, we say let's move to another room. Channel quiet request and response to performance the measurement so basically that is on an empty channel, we send a channel quiet request and we get back channel quiet response. So we can see that, yeah, this channel is being, you know, is available and the error rates are good. I mean, error rates are low and so on. Channel occupancy update. So this is similar to this add and remove. And, um, and then the BS may get the list of incumbents from a database. So there would be a database maintained by FCC which says that in this latitude and longitude, that's why you need latitude and longitude, at this location, these channels are available. Right? And these are disallowed and this and so on and so forth. So all that you can get from a database. All right. So we saw some new messages here in, in, in 802.22 which are mostly related to the business of moving from room to room, all right? Most of the other stuff is very similar to WiMAX, but WiMAX didn't have to move. Measurement management. So now we have to keep continuously measuring why we need to find out what's happening in addition to the noise, etc. We used to have channel estimation in WiMAX as well, but here it is more than channel estimation. We also need to find out about the owners, right? So sent by the BS. So it sends a bulk measurement request. Basically, it's sent by, it, by a broadcast address. And it says, well, please measure three times and tell me how is this frequency. All right? And then so there's a measurement response and then stop measurement request. So this is basically says now we don't have to send any more. Location configuration measurement request. And um, so I actually don't have more details on this one, but this is similar to these measurements except this is location configuration. So this has something to do with particular location. And um, so another request which is sent by the base station and then there's a response for that, right? Um, so
so i mean this is sta straight forward configuration management where when you get a new configuration you get new software from a tftp server tftp is what we call trivial file transfer protocol tftp like ftp server you have tftp server right everybody knows ftp server right so we have a tftp server here and so the t and so that is actually probably not very useful slide the whole slide basically so tftp is commonly used in every protocol anyway security management and so there are messages for privacy key management request and reply reject and acknowledge and then pkm eap start transfer pkm sate key challenge so now we haven't gone through security so i'm not going to discuss this right now here um so it will take a lot more time for us to figure out to explain to you what is eap eap and and tek and and pkm so i'm going to skip this part basically all we are going to say here is that there are messages for security purposes there are messages for power management as well then right power management is um if um, if the channel n is active which means somebody else is on then you don't use the next channel which is why we need to know the adjacent channel and um, when you are operating on a channel then you cannot use more than certain amount of power so that is called eirp eirp anybody remembers what is eirp stands for this was long time ago actually in physical layer when we talked about antenna then eirp stands for effective intrinsic radiated power so that is the maximum power basically eirp is the maximum power effective power so effective power is different than the power if i am transmitting 40 watts if i transmit in all 360 degrees in all directions then you will reach certain amount of power so that is that is what is called eirp but if i have a if i have a directional antenna then you may need you may get more power because i am not sending that 40 watt that i was sending all over now i'm sending it to just in this direction and so when you get more power we call that antenna gain so when we explain antenna gain that time i had explained eirp so eirp is limited when operating on the alternate channels which means n plus minus 1 and 2 and beyond so if channel 5 is busy by the television then we don't use 6 and 4 but beyond 5 6 and 4 you can use certain amount of power which is limited there is a new protocol called idrp idrp is incumbent detection recovery protocol and obviously we have seen some of those messages for idrp one message is that channel switching request and um, and then channel switching response if a cpe misses the channel switching request it times out if it does not hear from the base station then moves on to the next backup channel so basically when we are in this room 101 we decide our backup is room 100 All right, and so whenever somebody comes on this one, we go on to actually. In case of channels, you really won't go to 101 to 100. You will go from 101, let's say backup is 99 or something like that, right? So when we are moving, I will the, the base station will send a switching request, and everybody will move to that next room. And if a station doesn't really hear that switching request. then it will find that everybody is gone the room is empty nobody is responding the base station is not sending the beacons then it will first thing it will check is that room 99 because it knows that is where they must have gone very likely is that clear right so we already decide beforehand where the next room we will try there is a coexistence beacon protocol 
<clears throat> and this is used to signal to adjacent and overlapping WRAN cells for geolocation and for geolocation. So let's explain this. So suppose we are operating in channel 5, somebody is operating on channel 6, we want to tell them, look, I am here on channel 5. Why you want to tell them? First of all, we don't want them to come into channel 5 if they run out of channel 6. And another reason is that sometimes we want to talk to each other. And one reason we want to talk to each other is because we want to find out the location. And like generally, I mean, this geolocation thing is quite a bit in the standard, but most of these things are not moving that much because you need a big tower and you can't be moving. Once you put the tower, you are there for 10 years. So, but this is designed so that you could probably put the tower in a truck and move it. Um, but um, so the geolocation is there, but it's not used that much. So anyway, there's a whole protocol for doing that. CP bursts are transmitted by the selected CPEs at the end of the US subframe. So let's look at the US subframe. This is this US subframe. This is the DS subframe. This is the US subframe. At the end is this coexistence window. In this window, you transmit those CD, whatever CBP protocol messages there are. All right. So why it is sent by the subscriber station? Anybody? Why did not send by the base station? Because the subscribers are closer to the neighbors. Right? I mean, the, we are talking about the next 100 kilometers. This is a 100 mile thing, right? So the base stations are 200 miles apart. Right? So if you want to talk to the base station, you really go through the subscriber. Subscriber probably can talk to both towers at the same time. Okay? So CPE are transmitted at the end of the US subframe. CPEs decode the CPP frame from CPE cells in the operating in the same TV channels or adjacent channels. 14 types of CPP packets, including CPE backends, CPE, and CBE. Getting confused here. So there are 14 types of CBP packets, including CPE beacons. CPE beacons are transmitted by the CPEs and contain the channel GV channel number, backup channel number, BSID, CPE ID, and so on and so forth. So remember, the, previously the beacons were transmitted only by the base station in 16 as well as in um, 11. Here, even the CPEs transmit beacons once in a while. Basically, they send a beacon out saying that, look, we are using channel number 13. And our backup channel is so much, our base station ID is so much, and my ID is so much. And so these are heard by the people in the other neighborhood, in the other station, CPEs in the other neighborhood, and they tell their base station whatever they need to tell them. CPE packets are, CBP packets are used for coexistence and geolocation. So we already know that part. Okay. All right. Any question about CBP? So the new thing here is that the edge station play a lot of role in coordination with the other neighboring cells as opposed to the base station talking directly. And so as a result of that, we saw that this, the edge stations have to transmit beacons as well, right? So that the other neighbors can figure it out, what's happening here. Self coexistence. Two or more stations in the same space, time, and frequency. Um, so, obviously, you won't be working in the same space at the same time in the same frequency. But you might be working at the same time in the neighboring space or neighboring frequency. So that is what we are talking about here, right? So when you are 
working very close to another RAN, then we may want to make sure that we do not allocate uh, slots which interfere with the neighboring cell CPEs. So they need to coordinate. First of all, they need to coordinate uplink and downlink. Remember, if you remember in TDD, all the base systems have to have their downlink at the same time and their uplink at the same time. And in the, but remember why that was the case? Why the one cell cannot be transmitting down while the other is transmitting up? I'm sure I've discussed it at least twice. Once when we did TDD, which was in the file layer, and once maybe in WiMAX. But one of the things about TDD, one of the negative things about TDD is that every all these cells have to be synchronized. So that they are all transmitting down at the same time. Why? The thing is that the base station power level is very high and if a base station is transmitting at the same time a subscriber station is transmitting, there is no chance that the subscriber station will ever get through, even though it is talking to some other base. Right? And so we want to make sure that when when downtime when the time is for downlink, everybody talks downlink. So everybody so what will happen is a subscriber will hear two base stations, but both are strong signals, right? So it will be probably able to distinguish between them. But if it hears um, a base station signal, then it cannot hear any other signal at all. It cannot transmit itself also. So that's why, so basically that's what they're saying. So we do not allocate slots which interfere with the neighboring cell CPEs, dynamic resource renting and offering. Now this is, they are going just way too far on this whole standard. So they have dynamic resource renting and offering where less loaded BSS rent a spectrum to more loaded BSS. So you can say, well, I need one channel, can you please? And so they can start trading. Adaptive free on-demand channel contention. And then there is a protocol as to who will get that channel. So if there are the channel four is available, then who will get it? Two networks want it, so there is some kind of method by which which decides okay all right this station won the toss and therefore it gets it so here is an example of this renting and offering so base station one needs the channel and base station two has extra channels so it advertises that i have extra channels this one says, well, I need a channel. Can you please give me? This one says, okay, here is the location, and there is an act. So the, it will use those channels after that. BS1 can use those channels. After that, it needs a channel. Then it will say, please give me back my channel. And it will say, okay, all right, here is your channel back. And it says, okay, I got your request back. So there are these messages. So basically, the standard has messages which are called channel advertisement message, rent request message, Reservation allocation message, act message, collect request message, collection response message. So these are all the messages that are in the standard, so that you can do this renting. Thing. Question? Okay. All right. Similarly, here is another example. Um, here, base station three rented a channel, but then doesn't need the channel; it can return by itself. Right? Either the Owner asks it back, which is the left case, or the tenant gives it back, which is the right case. All right, so we have already talked about all these messages, resource advertisement, resource request, and so on and so forth. And when you have a request, it has a bid time, a start time, and the end time. It says, well, I need for next one hour. And so that is what is there. And then there is um, allocation response and um, whether it is satisfied or not satisfied, it could be neg negative response, which means that I cannot give you the channel. So that is dissatisfied. And resource allocation act, I got it. And then um, resource collection request and response, this is the collection, we saw here collection request and response. And then we have returning request and response, okay? So that's one thing. 
I think I will stop right there. Let me see how many more bytes are left. Um, slides are left. 26, 22. Four more slides to go. Um, okay, we'll stop right here and um, continue from this slide in the next class. Yeah. This for renting, do they, if the stations are owned by two different people, they actually pay for that? Is that what the is? So I, that's a good question. Is that because um, everything was was being actually the primary owner was actually having most of the channels, and therefore uh, these sub secondary owners how they got the ownership that's beyond me. It's quite possible that FCC gives some soft allocation to some secondary allocation to some people, and then they can rent it out. You know, uh, secondary allocation and. Um, Otherwise, um, the standard is allowed to be able to move to any channel which is available. And, but there must be some other restriction. That's the only reason. That's why somebody can rent out and, and rent in. Yeah. Yeah. My question is about the paper. About the paper, yeah. Go ahead. OK, so right now, the next assignment, which is due right after the week, I think. Let me see. Does anybody remember when the next 